Hello, welcome to the Friday, July 14th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Berlin, Germany. And hackers, of course, do not write all malware from scratch. Instead, malware often uses legitimate components, which, of course, can cause confusion when you're carelessly assembling indicators of compromise. Now, Malwarebytes has a blog post about just such a case. In this particular case, the malware is downloading FFmpeg. FFmpeg is a video library, a set of video conversion tools and the like that is often used by open source video software and in itself, not at all malicious, but this particular malware is downloading FFmpeg in order to be able to record video using the system's built-in camera and of course incorporate that in its spyware features. In itself, the malware is not really all that remarkable. It's your usual JavaScript file that then downloads additional components, should be spotted pretty easily by various anti-malware tools. Of course, I hope they will not add FFmpeg as a signature to their tools. Password wallets, of course, are a must have these days. And there are a number of competing offerings out there that pretty much offer sort of the same service where they will store your passwords in an encrypted wallet on your system. Now, all of these password wallets pretty much also offer the ability to sync password wallets between different devices. And of course, that's also an important feature these days where you no longer really just have one system that you use to access, for example, your online banking or other important accounts from. Now, where it gets tricky is if this password wallet is then stored in a public cloud, then of course others may have access to the files and what you're really relying on at this point is the strength of the encryption of this particular password file, which often is limited by the passphrase that you picked. Now, one password was one solution that actually originally only really supported the local syncing of password wallets and only more recently added the ability to use public cloud services. And earlier this year, one password announced that they're pretty much going to do away with the ability to locally sync your passwords. Now, this has caused quite a bit of confusion by users that selected one password in order to have the option to not store their passwords within a public cloud. Turns out that uh, one password essentially now takes the position that they will no longer really actively support uh, the local sync feature, but it will remain apparently in the software. So kind of up to you to figure out how it exactly works. Of course, there are still some solutions that do not require a public cloud account. You can go with them overall. I feel that there are really two reasons why a lot of the commercial password wallets are going with the public cloud. First of all, it's easier for them to get this to work. And secondly, it also allows them then to offer a subscription model like what 1Password does in order to get some recurring revenue. And SAP earlier this week did release its security patch set. Now with this update, they fixed 23 vulnerabilities. The set of vulnerabilities that's probably the most important here for users is the point of sales systems that are affected by these vulnerabilities. There are a number of vulnerabilities that got fixed in SAP's point of sale express system. Given how point of sale systems continue to be a big target in order to harvest credit card data and the like, well, uh, it's uh, probably one of the patches that you really should pay attention to. So it's a Friday again, and uh, as usually on Fridays, I do have an SDI student uh, with me here to talk about research projects that they're doing as part of the program. With me today, Roderick Curry. He actually worked on some pretty interesting research regarding car hacking. So Roderick, uh, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure, so my name is Roderick Curry, 
Um, I'm an information systems security manager with the Boeing company. Currently, I'm based in Southern California, and I support computing security for um, several different military flight test programs. Um, as you mentioned, I'm also an STI student, so I am um, approaching the final stretch of the uh, master's degree program in information security engineering. Um, I am studying for my GSE exam, and I am looking forward to attending the graduation ceremony coming up in Washington, D.C. this year. Yeah, so uh, Roderick, uh, you actually used your own car for some of these tests that you did uh, when it came uh, to hacking uh, vehicles. Were you actually afraid of voiding your warranty or breaking your car? There are definitely some liability issues and some legal issues when it comes to car hacking. In my most recent paper, I wrote in some detail about the legal aspect. And uh, up until less than a year ago, it was actually illegal to perform any kind of uh, modification of the car's software or to bypass any security controls on the car, um, even for the purpose of research. Thankfully, that law has changed, uh, which legally allows me to hack my car now. Uh, as for voiding the warranty, I expect that if a dealership knew that an individual was engaged in car hacking, I wouldn't be surprised if they voided that person's warranty, um, at least as it pertains to the electrical or the, the computer-driven um, components of the car. But in my case, um, I chose to work on my 2011 Honda Civic, uh, partly because it's already out of warranty, so that was a non-issue. Um, as for breaking the car, I I just said to myself, what's the worst that could happen? You know, worst case, if a test goes bad, then I might have to replace an ECU. Uh, I may be out a couple hundred dollars, but the car itself would still be intact. And then for the real risky stuff, I jacked up the vehicle, placed the vehicle on jack stands, and uh, just to get the wheels off the ground so that um, just to minimize the risk of unintended acceleration and, and just to try and be safe when, uh, when car hacking. Now, a lot of uh, your work and the other car hacking work uh, that I've seen sort of uh, centers around the CAN bus, which is sort of the network of the car, I guess. Most networks, uh, when you look at sort of layer two, like Ethernet and such, are pretty insecure. Is CAN bus any different in that way? You know, I like to think of the CAN bus today as being similar to how the internet was back in, say, the 1990s. And this also is true for the other network uh, types that you'll find in vehicles, not only the CAN bus, but other automotive networks. Because attacks on vehicles are not really commonplace yet, I think very little has been done to secure those networks. It's only just now that attackers are beginning to probe for vulnerabilities in these networks. And uh, network designers are just now starting to think about incorporating encryption or authentication. You have to keep in mind that the, the CAN protocol uh, dates back to the 1980s. And at that time, it wasn't designed to be secure. It was, it was designed to be lightweight, robust, but uh, security wasn't even a consideration back then. And um, the problem today is that now we're living in this age of malware, ransomware, cyber warfare, and people are still buying vehicles today that run on this 30-year-old uh, insecure platform that really has seen little by way of updates or progress in that time. Now, uh, when I was sort of reading up a little bit uh, on car hacking in general, a CAN bus, as far as I understand it, usually requires physical access, but I came across a couple of methods that actually worked remotely. One that I found particularly interesting uh, was a paper that actually used digital radio signals in order to attack some of the Android-based vehicle entertainment systems. Any interface there uh, where I could go then from the entertainment system to the CAN bus? And is this sort of a realistic attack where someone could actually break into the car remotely via digital radio signals like this? Right, absolutely. So I've written previously about the work of Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek. Charlie and Chris were, uh, in many ways, they were the pioneers of modern car hacking. Uh, you might remember a couple of years ago when they performed a hack against a brand new unaltered uh, Jeep Cherokee vehicle and um, the media attention from that hack ended up resulting in the recall of over a million vehicles for patching. That attack was performed by exploiting a vulnerability in the Sprint cellular network paired with a vulnerability in Fiat Chrysler's Uconnect uh, infotainment system. 
So at the time, this was groundbreaking because this really was the first time that a complete remote attack had been carried out. These uh, these guys from a from a remote location were able to access the Jeep by its uh, via its onboard cellular connection. Uh, from there, they were able to pivot to the critical control systems of the vehicle, which let them manipulate the brakes, the steering, the transmission. Uh, they essentially took full control of this car, and. Uh, in my opinion, these type of attacks are likely to become more common as uh, we find almost every component of a vehicle is now interconnected in some way. Anything I can do as a user against this? Uh, can I sort of epoxy up these CAN bus ports or uh, can I patch secure the car myself? Don't take any epoxy to your car anytime soon. I hate to say that there's not much you can do, but really there isn't much as, a, as an end user that you can do at this point. We're really at the mercy of the automakers. Um, now at home, you can patch your desktop computer, you can run antivirus software, you can deploy a firewall, but on your car, you, you can't do any of these things. So if there is a critical security patch for your vehicle, you'll probably get a notice in the mail from uh, the automaker and you'll have to take your car to the dealership and uh, if that does happen to you then obviously I recommend you get that patch. However, these type of physical recalls are rare. Uh, this has only happened a few times uh, so far in history and it's obviously very cumbersome and very expensive to patch vehicles in that way. Um, a better approach from the automakers is over the air patching. You might know that some manufacturers like Tesla are already pushing out security patches to owners' vehicles over the air without the owner actually having to lift a finger. But if you're really truly concerned about your car being hacked, then the best advice I can give you is uh, buy a vehicle that's 10 or 15 years old and doesn't have the kind of interconnectivity or the kind of computerization that we see in modern vehicles. Um, now, more realistically, the best thing we can do um, or the best thing the public in general can do is try to encourage automakers to take the risk seriously and uh, hopefully build more secure systems going forward. Now you mentioned over the air patching, isn't that risky in itself? Uh, are you aware of any vulnerabilities kind of where someone could patch a car with sort of an unauthenticated uh, malicious uh, firmware update? Right, and that's that's a documented uh, risk that's been, been written about in theory, but so far we haven't seen that in the wild. Um, certainly there's a risk there also. Um, I think the automakers have to weigh the, uh, the benefits um, versus the risks when it comes to uh, should we bring millions of vehicles into the dealership for physical patching um, or should we uh, take the risk of over the air. And uh, you know that's a decision that's often made in the boardroom um, and uh, money talks. So often they'll take the, the cheaper option when it comes to that rather than the more secure option. Did with the Chrysler patch, I think I remember that they also e uh, mailed uh, USB sticks uh, to customers, but I'm not 100% sure if that was the Chrysler or another uh, patch. That also sounds somewhat uh, dangerous given that there's only a good way to authenticate that USB stick to make sure that you actually got the real thing. Or Right, exactly. They, they did. Um, the Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler did mail USB sticks to affected users. Um, they gave individual owners the option of would you like to bring your car into the dealership or do you feel comfortable uh, patching your car at home and uh, some uh, owners went with the more convenient option of having the USB stick mailed to them. Uh, others would uh, rather take their car in and have it patched by a, a technician. But uh, each, each approach has risks and uh, really over the air is probably the best way to go when you consider that the, the average vehicle owner is probably not very computer savvy um, and probably would not want to be uh, patching their own vehicle using a USB stick. So I guess we'll be waiting for Car Patch Tuesday or something like that uh, coming up in future months. Now, anything you're working on right now, anything we should expect from you in the near future? So uh, as for right now, um, I mentioned I'm currently studying for the GSE exam, so that's my big priority right now. Um, all my car hacking research is on hold at this point, but uh, car hacking is something I really enjoy, and I fully intend to keep pressing forward with this. Um, I already have big plans for my wife's vehicle, but she just doesn't know that yet. 
<laughs> that sounds good. So uh, thanks for joining me here, Roderick. And uh, that was it. Uh, as usual, you can find Roderick's paper in the SANS uh, reading room and on the www.sans.edu website. That's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.